Want to become an AI trailblazer in the product world? Pragmatic Institute's newest workshop, AI for Product Professionals, is your ticket to generative AI mastery. In this hands-on training, learn to master chat GPT and prompt engineering to transform your product strategies, rapidly create content, optimize workflows, and make razor-sharp product decisions fueled by data. Don't just keep up with the AI revolution. Lead it. Seats are limited. Enroll today at pragmaticinstitute.com slash AI workshop. Hello, and welcome to Pragmatic Institute product chat series, where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product professionals and with some of the best minds in the industry. I'm Charles Topping, facilitator of Pragmatic Institute Labs, founder of the Win Loss Agency, and your host for this episode. As you may know, Pragmatic Institute's vice president of product and host of this very podcast, Rebecca Calajaris, recently announced that she was moving on from Pragmatic Institute. Rebecca has insightfully interviewed the best minds in the industry for years, but the one she hasn't interviewed yet is the one that I would most like to hear from, and that's Rebecca herself. So let's flip the script on this podcast and instead put Rebecca in the hot seat to give reviews on the current state of product, her time at Pragmatic Institute, and her perspective on how product has changed over time. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks, Charles. This is exciting. Now I feel kind of what the guests do. You're like, I don't, I don't know what you're going to ask next. Well, so this what? is exciting for me because I get to feel what you feel like when you're doing the podcast. Right? All the power. <laughs> no, 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 no. The power goes to the editor of the podcast who's going yes. to save me multiple times on this. So Rebecca, this is really exciting stuff for you to be moving on to the next phase of whatever it is that you're doing. As you move on, what do you think is the one major thing faced by product professionals today? That's a great question and something at Pragmatic that we, we have sort of a great line into what's happening in the, in the space, right? We do the Nahito visits that we teach about. We do our own win-loss reports. We do surveys. And of course, we just we see thousands and thousands of students a year and we talk to a bunch of different companies. So we have all kinds of inputs coming in. And I think what's interesting, as I've been here 11 years, that it continues to be sort of the same problem. What continues to be the biggest struggle for product people is the amount of time spent on the day to day that does not enable them to spend the time on the strategic, right? And what those other things are evolves a little bit, what kind of meetings they are, what they might look like. But that is consistently the issue. Like we are hired and we are excited to be product people because we have and we want to help define the vision of what's coming, right? And really keep the company competitive and on top of line. And what unfortunately we are just often bogged down is sort of the tyranny of the urgent, right? The meetings that need to be answered, the technical review that we need to do on, let's say, release notes or the the conversations we need to have with marketing or sales, or maybe we need to do demos. There's so much of that tactical stuff that we're lucky if we're setting the vision for the next release, let alone really being able to set this organization up through products and partnerships and acquisitions for a future down the road. Rebecca, I'm a decade into being pragmatic certified and the opening lines of foundations as I remember it was something along the lines of we all spend our time down here in the bottom right and yep. where we really want to spend our time is up here in the top left. Why do you think that is? You know, it's interesting too, because that was the story when I started. And in the bottom right, for those not familiar with the framework or who haven't had it memorized, like I have a phrase, <laughs> the bottom <laughs> right tends to be really more tactical go-to-market activities. Now, as we've seen over the years, in particular the last eight years, let's say, a rise of product marketing within organizations, then we find product management isn't necessarily there. Where they're often bogged down now is sort of the middle bottom. Again, for those playing at home who don't have it memorized, the middle bottom is, is really the kind of day-to-day -day partnership with development. So that's where you're going to find use scenarios and requirements and those sort of more execution oriented, but on the technical or product side of the house. And that's where we often feel it now. I remember about 15 years ago or so, we had an executive vice president who came to our vice president and said, I want your team to be more strategic. Mm -hmm. Love that, don't you? Oh, great. I'm not being strategic. I, the thing is, wonderful. <laughs> they didn't know what that meant. 
And in fact, there's such a broad idea of what it means to even be more strategic. And then walking into the pragmatic world, all of a sudden, here are clear definitions of what that means to be strategic. I wonder, do you have any perspective on why companies don't realize that that's where we could and should be spending our time? I mean, I think some of it continues to be, and this is frustrating as someone who's been marketing and product in this space for so long, a lack of understanding of what the role is outside of product organizations within companies. I mean, I, we've gotten a whole lot better over the last 10 years in understanding product. There are now you know, commercials that'll talk about product management. You're like, we've made it. But I still think it's not that well known and it's very inconsistently defined across organizations and often within organizations, right? So they don't necessarily know what to expect of us. That's the sort of them problem. There is an us problem, I think, as well for product management and often why we don't have enough time, quote unquote, to do the strategy is we tend to be a lot of type A, let's get it done people. So there's a piece of that. And there's a piece of some of the tactical things that we do are in an odd way at in the moment rewarding, right? You never get to check off of your to-do list like, market research and market analysis and even things like personas, right? They evolve and change a lot. Some of mm -hmm. the tactical activities though, like it's really rewarding at the end of the day, you can look and be like, I wrote the requirements that were due or I did that lunch. It's like, it's very, you know, there's a piece of it that feeds you and it's very comfortable. You have the end of the day, you have things you can show that you do. And so often we ourselves gravitate or even volunteer when we see holes because we know we're going to get that kind of satisfaction. And that's the us problem of of why we're not always able to spend some time on the strategy. So I do think we have to look internally, or at least I've had to look internally in my own career and be like, ooh, some of that's me. No one's telling me to do that. But you're like, but I saw a problem and I wanted to fix it. And yeah. What's your favorite box in the pragmatic framework and why is it market problems? <laughs> I was going to say like, I could be fired retrospectively if I don't say it's market problems. I think the ghosts of instructors past will come for me. No, I mean, it is 100% market problems, right? Because it truly is when you understand your market and every single time you find and you scrap your time to go out and do a call with a customer, you're going to like slap yourself on the head and be like, why don't I do this all the time? Then you'll get back in the day to day and you'll forget. But because when I really understand them, I can make really intelligent decisions about every other box on there, right? I know what language they use. I know what problems they have. I know how they value those problems, right? I have a deep understanding. And that is what I'm going to use to do effective positioning, to know what they're willing to pay, to decide what the right market channels are and what kind of partnerships might be good opportunities. All of that is based on market problems. If I don't know that, I'm making everything else up. Which box is your comfort zone? Oh, uh, to do? Like, where do I live in like a career kind of thing? Is that what you're thinking? Or like... <laughs> I mean, I'd like to be honest and say I can do all of them. Ha <laughs> ha, no, I can't. <laughs> that, that would be the opposite of us. But the places I think where I naturally both find interest and excel are things like positioning, the buyer persona. I definitely have a product marketing bent mm -hmm. to me, right? There's no question Indeed. I've done product management, but I definitely do have a product marketing bent. So you put me in that positioning, buyer experience, buyer personas, which still leaves you with your marketing problems and win loss. The other place that I've had, most recently at Pragmatic, some experiences with and which I think I find really intriguing is the buy, build, partner. I think partnerships are something that we underutilize as a product team. And yeah. I think acquisitions are a really interesting way to think about how you use the framework to do acquisitions. And if people listening, if you haven't heard the Frank Tate podcast on mergers and acquisitions, you should go listen to that podcast. That man knows that framework deeper than I do. And it's a really, really interesting podcast. But I think acquisitions are an opportunity for product people to really have an impact on the organization in a really meaningful way. I think carving out time to keep an eye on that place is a good opportunity. And it's fascinating to be part of. I've been a part of two different PE flips at Pragmatic, and I've been a part of an acquisition. And we've done some diligence on some others. And it's just, a, it's super interesting. You joined Pragmatic all the way back in September 2011. I did. It was that that was a different world. It, it product sure was. itself was a totally different world. We were only three or four years into even smartphones existing. What was Pragmatic like at the time when you first walked in the doors? So I'm, I'm going to go back just a little bit further than that. I first took the training in 2005. 
So I was, I was, I did. So I always joke that I was like, I'm not just the president. I'm also a client, right? uh, (laughs) Right. I took it in 2005 when I worked with a software company, I'd made the pitch to our CEO that we needed to start a product management organization within the company. He's like, that's great. You should do that. And then I was like, I know how to do it. (laughs) So I was looking for training and my dad had taken the training. He was a developer at MicroFocus and MicroFocus sent like everybody, including the developers to the training. So he's like, you should take this training. So I took the training and then I used it in my career and it made a huge difference. I was I was like, I took my books everywhere. Every company I worked with after I took the training was like, oh, let me get some pragmatic says. <laughs> and so when I took this opportunity, it was very much as a fan, right? I was a huge fan of the product. I knew it would work. I knew it was like successful and it had an impact. And I'd been in a lot of software right before that had been a bit of vaporware. So mm. I was like, oh, it's a product I can believe in. And as a marketer, you're like, that's, you know, makes a big difference, right? Because then it becomes something difference. that you can be quite passionate about. Oh, yeah. And it was, I mean, when I joined, we were run by Craig Stull, who is the founder and the creator of the Pragmatic Framework. And it was still very, very much a lifestyle company, right? He'd been a VP of products. He saw this problem that people didn't really understand. He built a framework. He's like, all right, I quit my job. And I'm probably like trained like a thousand people, right? This is like in 93. And then he's like, and then I'll be done, right? And then it didn't, right? It really became this sort of institution. It was very well known. And he did that by being really, really passionate in a couple of different areas. One was consistency, right? One of the biggest advantages we give is getting your teams to speak the same language and kind of on the same page. And in order to do that, I have to be able to train your hundreds, maybe thousands of people all across the globe. And if I'm going to do that timely, I obviously need to be able to use multiple instructors right? And all of those things add changes. There were some companies, like it can feel like really different trainings. And we want to make sure that your team is on the same page, whether they come to a private or a public, no matter which version they, you know, which session they came to, it's really, really consistent. So he was passionate about that. He was clearly passionate about market problems, right? Like this was always going to be fundamental to what he was. And he was really passionate about the experience, right? You would go and you're going to get, we would call it white glove, like a really quality, the places we trained, the materials we gave. All of that was just designed to feel like it was all inclusive. This wasn't a place where like, okay, go ahead, go find your lunch or hope you ate breakfast before you came. He was always passionate about it was worth it to spend a little more to make it here. And he built an amazing brand. And one of the best parts about coming here was not only just an amazing brand, but such a passionate alumni base, Charles. You pick up the phone, you call a client, and they're, they won't just talk to you. They're excited and sometimes flattered you call. They're like, oh, oh, Pragmatic One wants to talk to me. I mean, it was, it was so powerful. Well, so it ends up creating so this, like, a, it creates this like family relationship that people yep. end up having. Yep. Is once you identify, you instantly speak a common language with people with whom you haven't even worked before. You just plain get how yeah. that sits, right? Well, and you get it, right? Very few, I think, product managers feel like anyone in their organization understands what they do, let alone their life, right? Like my kid doesn't, you know, follow mine does. My, my, my poor kid's heard it her whole life. But, you know, there's a lot of, to, to be able to talk to someone else who really understands is exciting and it's rewarding and it's safe and it's interesting And you can really poke at different concepts in a way that does really appeal to people. The other thing on the flip side of this, and I don't mean this in a bad way, it was a lifestyle company and it was a lifestyle company as someone was probably getting closer to retirement, right? When you get closer to retirement, just like we all do with our portfolios of our investment portfolios, if we're lucky enough to have one, you get more and more risk averse, right? There is a golden goose. The golden goose is going to carry you to the end. And it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's all working really, really well. But as someone who came in new, there were a few spots where I was like, man, I really wish we could push a little harder on some of the things. I think we wish we could push a little harder on the type of offering, the type of partnerships. And a big area that there was, and I'm not alone here, there there were several execs, really wanted to push a little bit on online training. And there was just too much risk. And this was quite a bit ago as well, but there was too much risk, too much concern about sort of security. And the same thing was true for us going international with our training, right? There was a lot of concern in those areas. And so while I understood it as an exec on the team, especially as I got to be an exec, there was a desire from my end and from many of us in our gym and our president to be able to push a little bit there. And so those were kind of like the two parts of it. But yeah. 
I'm taking a moment to process all of that. That's, <laughs> I, I mean, so I've been around for a while, so I know quite a few of these things, but that even presents insights for me. Yeah. Um, what was the product world like at the time? I mean, as I mentioned, smartphones had just come in. Twitter's uh, less than five years old at the time. What, what did product feel like at the time you joined Pragmatic? So all the young people listening are going to laugh at this, but it's sort of like when I first started, we had a product for our major product was called Requirements That Work. And then we had another one that was called Living in an Agile World for those few small, unusual companies who practice Agile, Charles. Um, <laughs> And, you know, it's like, maybe, maybe this thing will stick around. Maybe it won't. But, you know, you did. You had a lot less SaaS products. You had, right, it's the speed of change and speed of releases was very, very different. So we were talking about being more fluid and stuff. For some of the companies, it was like, no, no, no. Like, we really were still doing market research documents that were, you know, 40 pages deep and PRDs and big pieces. And Agile is very new, right? And some of the other, not just Agile, but SaaS products, right? And you think about that constant release wasn't something that existed when you had only really on-premise or when it was like just a few of the SaaS places. Things like design UX, right? You just put up with the fact it was a cruddy, it was a cruddy experience. You're like, oh, I'm just glad it works. And I got my little C prompts and Right. So there was a whole lot of other places. Oh, and the other big fourth one that I think was really different, which sounds really funny right now. This was true in product and it was also super true in marketing as you were just like, man, I wish I had data. I just don't have enough data. Right. Nothing collected data. And now you have like the opposite problem. You have so much freaking data. Who can make this data make sense? Right. How do I analyze (laughs) this data quickly? How do I make it so it's like actionable and I can really like you know, make changes on it. Like those are big, big changes that didn't exist back then. It's funny though, because it's a little bit like the boil the frog story, right? You don't, like there isn't a moment when I'm like, and then lightning crashed across the right, sky right. and so, everything so changed. I even, I, no, yeah. I even have, I have planned a question of what's the inflection point here, but you're saying there was no inflection mm-mm, point. Mm-mm. I mean, there's definitely, there are big things, right? Like agile obviously isn't, it did, didn't go away and nobody doesn't do some form of agile now. And But it's really just sort of a combination of things, right? It's that plus data. It's the speed at which things change. And we, and we really got into SaaS and it, there isn't a spot where you're like, that's it. That's where we went differently. I do think, you know, I don't, I can't give you a time spot, but I think what happened was B2C products, B2C products, both from a software and hardware perspective, we're on extraordinarily fast turnarounds, right? As the as the chips and everything else go. And it just, B2C had so much momentum that B2B had to stop being like, we don't have to play along with that. We're B2B and businesses don't care, right? Like it got, the gap got so big that you're like, if my silly app here can do this, there's no way your thing can't be better. And I, I think B2C just sort of like pulled B2B into to realizing that, look, these same things that matter over here and need to matter over here and you need to make it happen. You talked about Pragmatic Institute being more of a lifestyle business at the time and wanting to see some things kind of change. What was that process like transitioning into we have a thing now that we're all really serious about? Well, that process for us was like, that was a really clear process for us. For what we did, what Craig did was actually bring the company to market. So we went out and did a sales process, which was, again, super exciting part you know scary you don't know what's gonna you don't know who's gonna buy you or whatever but super oh man i learned a ton so we went out to process and we got bought by a pe firm named renovus and petra both and they had a lot of experience with education companies and even Mm -hmm. throughout the process it's really clear that you guys are aligned in the areas of growth and investment and so they bring a little bit deeper pockets and higher you know they're looking for a, a strong return but they have a little bit more room in the short term to go through. So we brought in them and and it was really clear like hey, let's really let's go forward in to a wider degree of going international. Let's really look at online. Let's make these kind of investments in partnerships and other offerings, right? Labs and our uh, partner learning network, those kind of things, doing on-demand courses. All of that was under the Renovus's uh, umbrella. That really was the change from when and it you know, it was super exciting, right? That's exactly what you've been hoping for. But also as an executive, it's a it's a big difference to go from being life. You can just go walk and talk to Craig and Karen and, you know, everybody knows what this is like piece to the kind of 
accountability, that's not quite the word, like the reporting and all of those things that a PE firm is looking for is very, very different than yeah. what was a cash-based accounting company when I started. What advice would you give to 2011 September Rebecca walking in the door? Oh, what a great question. I mean, I've made more than <laughs> more than my fair share of mistakes, Charles, but I I loved every minute of working here, right? I mean, I didn't leave here. They didn't leave the role. I'm still here on the podcast. I'm not going anywhere. I didn't leave the role because I was like, oh, I don't love this company. I don't believe in the vision anymore. I, I left it for personal reasons to spend some time with my my kiddo before she she doesn't like me anymore. She's, you know, 13. I only got a little bit of time. She'll come back around, I know, but and to kind of get a different so while there's things I change, I wouldn't it's like, you know, all the sci-fi movies. I'd be afraid that I would say something or give a piece of advice that wouldn't make it follow the arc it did because I I loved the people I worked for. I loved all the opportunities. I loved how far we've gone. I mean, there's some decisions that right now I'd be like, oh I've done that. But I don't know how that's going to play out. And I know that it was a really dedicated group of people making the best decisions they could at the time. So I would just say, hey, have some fun. I had in my notes here, you would tell her to buy Apple stock. <laughs> I think it was too late. As long as the go was, I think it was too pricey then. I think I'd have to pick something else of which there were options. <laughs> Uh, the spring 2017 issue of Product Marketer Magazine was simply titled Brand. Oh, that's my that's that that's my all time favorite issue of the magazine. The lead air article was where does product end and brand begin? Mm -hmm. You've now made a career of that place. What's your perspective of product ending brand beginning in 2023? I don't think there is an end. Right. I think they're one in the same. And I think companies who who don't embrace that, both sides struggle a little bit. Now, to be fair, I've spent most of my career in smaller organizations, small to medium, right? And so if I'm, you know, if I'm Dell, maybe this is a little bit, <laughs> bit different. I've got a million different options, right? But I truly do think that brand and product, particularly in the technology space, are and should be one in the same. And if your product isn't delivering on your brand promise, then your market's going to rec recognize that and you're going to have a problem, right? You, and if your brand doesn't actually talk about your product experience, the same thing, that that sort of dissonance or disconnect is just, it, it doesn't work. And so I, do, I don't think there's an end. But I also really like playing in both places, so I might be biased. I have always been impressed by the brand stance of Pragmatic. When I go to the site, when I consume the magazine, the feel of that. That's your work. What went into that? How did you go about reaching that brand voice, that stance of pragmatic? That's you. I'd love to hear it. Well, and it's me and, I, and an amazing team. I have, I had, but I will always say have the best team that I've ever worked with. I know you've touched a bunch of them, Charles, and you can, you can, they're amazing. They're extremely passionate. They work really, really hard. They have a ton of fun doing it. But I think what it comes down to, well, a lot of it is, you know, we kind of drank our own champagne, right? We would do the market research. And it wasn't just me doing market research. I would make every single member of the product marketing and the marketing communication team do Nahida visits. Our mm. marketing administrator would do it. Our graphic designer, our art designer, every single one would do market visits because that allows you to understand the market and really sort of live that. And that helps you understand the brand in a deeper way than, hey, our brand guide says I should do these four colors. Like we we took too long. We took a long time to actually get like a really well-documented brand guide because for mm. a long time, like the the eight of us there, you just knew. And then we got to be so much bigger and there's 20 of us. And you're like, well, that's unfair for, for our new Natalie to be able to understand the same as, you know, Kelly, who's been here. So, so we documented it. But it really was about living that at a different level going to the classes, making sure you're interacting so that you could see the importance and the embodiment of it. You know, we do our positioning documents, right? It's painful. I know every one of you out there is like, oh, but it's so hard. I know it really is hard. It's always hard. It's hard for everyone. And it's so powerful when it's done. So you should do them. And it does give us a base there. And again, it's just a, it's a very close team. And I, um, I used to say picky and they corrected me and said, no, 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 Rebecca, you're particular, which particular. I think is delightful. <laughs> so it's a, a wonderful level up. So we are, we are always all looking at everyone's other output and everybody gives advice to make it on brand and the best it can be. And the magazines, if you haven't, 
if you're listening and you're like, magazines, print magazines, what are they talking about? Before COVID, we did print magazines. They're on the website. And I think there are some exceptional issues there. And I will shout out Norman Wong, who is our art director and designed every single issue there, of which he won numerous awards. We've had some great editors. We have amazing contributions from people from from Apple to Dell to I mean, just there, there's a lot of people in there and a lot of great topics that I would absolutely recommend you take a look at. So I found it to be required reading and that it's got long tail use in the information inside. Mm -hmm. That's not just about a snapshot in time, which, of course, the magazine yeah. sometimes is ephemeral. But this is long term like, oh, wow, I really get that differently now. I say in that way, like there's like a little journal quality to it, right? Where it is more evergreen topic, philosophical topics, not, you know, hey, how are you going to use AHA for this piece? Now that there's not really good information in that, but that would not be nearly as as evergreen. You started your career as a head copywriter. Mm -hmm. At agency. Thank you. I'll leave, I'll leave it to you to mention the dates of when that happened, if you like. <laughs> nope. <laughs> What's the secret to writing good copy? Ah, uh, edit. Right. And you, I mean, did you hate, I hated hearing that when I was in school. I was like, mm, 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 I don't want to edit. I don't want to even proof it. It's edit, right? Because it is when you peel off all the other layers that you get to the gold. And the other thing that is, is interesting too, that is, I think sometimes hard when you're still a primary writer is, especially when you're working B2B or B2C, when you really get the right positioning statements, when you get that really kite copy. It's really, really exciting. Like for me, it's one of those like you can feel it in your belly. You get the little butterflies and you're like, oh, got it, got it. And that part's really fun. The part that maybe is less fun sometimes when you switch, particularly from like this is with a switch from ad agency to marketing, is that you have to keep using those words, right? And it can start to feel like a cheat when you're a writer. You're like, but I've already said those things. But like that's part of the branding is the consistency and the reuse of that. But yeah, it's editing. And it's stepping away, coming back and editing and making sure that there is nothing left that you wouldn't cut. That would be my key. As you're moving on to the next phase, what do you think products is going to be facing in the near term? What should folks be looking out for? I mean, you hate to say this because everyone is saying this currently, but certainly the generative AI is adding opportunity and risk and complexity and certainly spending some time yourself to figure out how you can and where you could or should and shouldn't use it is good because you're probably, I'm, I'm like, this is probably like months after these conversations have, but other people are going to be like, but you don't need to worry about it anymore. Magic can happen, right? And, and, and they're going to come for you and they're going to make that argument about why you don't need the other hire or you don't need that resource. So you really need to understand it and be able to, to use it where it makes sense. And there are some great opportunities there but also be able to sort of shield from the magicness, right? But that's always the tough part there. What else? I mean, I do think we're continue to see the rise of product marketing. That's not just my personal hope and dream. We'll see there. And then another place that I think, you know, we always, I think internationalization and working with global products and global companies is something that those of us based in the U.S., have some miles to catch up on. And I think if we don't catch up pretty quickly in the thinking of how you run product across multinational organizations, it's just imperative that we learn because it, the world gets smaller. I remember attending a product marketing conference about seven years ago, and ultimately the theme of the conference was, what is product marketing? And then I attended another one not too long ago and couldn't help but notice that that was still kind of bubbling below the surface. Do you think that product marketing is going to come up with a definition of self? Is it something that's still going to be kind of nebulous in, in definition? What do you think? That's a great question. I mean, I, I would say, again, it's definitely gotten more mature and understood. It's still far less understood than product management. And in, in Europe, it's, it's further behind than the US. So it's still fairly early on, which is odd for a career I've had for decades, but true. I also think it's somewhat evolving. We've seen some of the, you know, there are places which you could think of traditional as product marketing, but I think there are some places that traditionally would have been thought of as product management, that product marketing has started to have a bigger play in, partly because product management is in that product owner role in some organizations, right? So they're really in the day-to-day -day spot and they're, and so the product marketing is coming over. But because of that, because of that inconsistency, I think it's really hard to define it. 
right? Because my definition of it, is it the ideal definition? And, and there's just tension between product management and product marketing as it is. So I don't know that it will get a successful definition. And it's, it's interesting. Neither product management or product marketing, I know definitions from them that I would say are the right definitions, but I clearly have a bias. But I don't think there is that globally accepted one in the way that you think of as a CPA, right? But part of that is sort of a global certification body that says this is what a CPA is or degrees that require certain things. And that's one of the reasons pragmatic pushes for the certification so high is to start to get some consistency around the definition, but it just hasn't gotten to that sort of global standpoint. So I don't know that there'll be, there's not a governing body to grant, you know, hey, that is okay, the official, the official piece. So I don't think we're particularly close to a unifying everyone agrees on definition. Rebecca, I can't thank you enough for taking on the hot seat today. <laughs> it's tough over here. <laughs> well, you did for somebody with so little experience. You did, you did great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Look, I'm just going to take this opportunity to speak on behalf of your listeners, of whom I am one, and to thank you and congratulate you on an incredibly impressive body of work through your time at Pragmatic Institute, and also to wish you very well on your journey into your next steps, wherever it is that you may end up. And I hope you get to spend much more time with your family. And also, I look forward to hearing you further here on the podcast. Thank you, Charles. This was delightful. My pleasure. So once again, I'm Charles Topping. I'm a facilitator of Pragmatic Labs and also the founder of the Win Loss Agency. And I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast. Don't forget to join us next week. That's where Kevin's going to cut that out. <laughs> Kyle, Kyle, help. Oh, That's where right. Kyle's going to cut that out. <laughs> and that last little bit is what Kyle is going to leave in as a joke, like they do at the end of a Hot Ones episode. Right? <laughs>